During the beginning of the gay erotica film explosion, Jay Bryan was already near legendary as a well-known photographer of naked young men. Once he picked up a film camera, he made a handful of significant films that are classics today. In gay popular culture, Jay Bryan's Seven in a Barn satisfies an authentic artifact of early gay cinema made especially interesting because of its use of scripted dialogue and sound. Most gay porn films of the 1970s were silent movies with music added. Dean Chasson may be the most prolific gay porn star you've never heard of. Chasson's career began in 1969 and was mostly over by the time every household had a VCR. On this episode, we're going to celebrate Jay Bryan, the quintessential San Francisco filmmaker known for his photography, films, and notorious escort agency. Jay Bryan's film, Seven in a Barn. One of the earliest documents we have of gay porn with synchronized sound, a shooting script, and male group sex. Gay porn star Dean Chasson, a gay porn model who came to prominence during the late 1960s and continued his career into the 1990s before disappearing completely. This is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped you get off. Before we continue, I want to remind you to help this channel by clicking the subscribe button and selecting the bell icon for notifications to see more content like this. Every little bit helps and I absolutely appreciate it. Thank you. Brian J. Donahue was born in 1943 in Alameda County, California. Not much of his personal life is publicly known from birth to the moment of his initial involvement in publishing which came by way of science fiction fan communities. He attended San Jose College in the early 1960s to pursue a major in professional printing, and as early as 1959, he was providing illustrations for collaborative fanzines published out of the Bay Area. Gay liberation activist Jim Kepner, also a member of the Californian science fiction fan community, introduced Brian to gay life and culture. Kepner, who was a vocal proponent of being open about one's gay identity, set Brian on a path towards affirming his sexual identity. Love and sex seemed to permeate all over the place, and it was during that time that Jay Brian made the decision to pick up a camera and start photographing hot, nude young men. He soon dropped out of college at San Jose State and followed his interest in male physique art. In 1962, the Supreme Court decision in Manual Enterprises, Inc. v. Day, ruled that magazines featuring pictorials of nude and scantily clad men were not legally obscene under the federal law prescribing the mailing of obscene matter. This ruling proved the boon for the industry and for J. Bryan's entry into physique photography. At first, Bryan photographed acquaintances as a hobby, but eventually friends encouraged him to sell his prints. Initially, he sold sets of photo enlargements to local adult bookstores in San Francisco. He then began to advertise photo sets and commissioned drawings in gay-oriented physique magazines under the studio name Gallery Vitruvian, a name inspired by Leonardo da Vinci's male body ideal represented in the Vitruvian Man. Brian made his debut commercial venture into the physique market with a Gallery Vitruvian advertisement in H. Lynn Womack's popular physique magazine, Manuel. Each subsequent month, Brian's photographs increasingly appeared in other physique magazines, culminating that year in a centerfold for the British modern Adonis. In 1965, Brian started his own magazine, Male Nudist Portfolio, under the name GVA Productions, and featured work of both Brian and other photographers. Male Nudist Portfolio was daring for the time as it fused the physique magazine with full frontal nude photography, a combination that would not become common in physique magazines until later in the 1960s following the district court decision in U.S. v. Spiner. Brian was allegedly the first in modern era to publish male full frontal nudes. Keep in mind, Physique Pictorial did not publish its first fully nude male until 1969. Brian moved to San Francisco in the mid-1960s with his partner who opened the San Francisco gay bookshop, Adamus. They formed Califran Enterprises, a photographic studio, which also published the magazine Golden Boys. J. Brian's Golden Boys series focused on all-American, innocent, and well-endowed young men. You know, 
The type of casting that eventually dominated the gay porn industry in the late 1970s, 80s, 90s, and, well, you get the picture. It became a trademark for the magazine and the signature archetype Brian is remembered for today. He would later adapt this aesthetic for the motion picture. During this time, Brian began producing loops, his first being a loop called Tony on the Beach, which would play at midnight at theaters. On October 22, 1969, Brian had his first full program of short films, Opus One, screened theatrically at the Park Showroom in San Francisco. One of his notable loops, Come to the Orgy, was considered the first modern gay porn film with group sex. Given the fierce demand of gay-oriented theatrical films in both San Francisco and Los Angeles in 1969, it was only a matter of time before Brian joined his physique loop contemporaries like Pat Rocco, Bob Miser, and Dick Fontaine in transitioning to the production of films for public exhibition at gay theaters. In 1971, Brian opened a modeling agency in San Francisco called J. Brian's Models. If you were a fan of the Golden Boys magazine and the loops that Brian had released, you may have been in luck since many of the models that were featured in the publications were also available for hire. With the modeling agency, everything was surreal. A life of photography, partying, and big bank deposits. That same year, Brian would release his breakout narrative, Seven in a Barn. Then the legal harassment began, and with every year that passed, it became harder for Brian to continue his business. A police raid and obscenity charges put an end to Brian's modeling agency in 1972. After months of arduous litigation, Brian quit the business and moved to Hawaii, where he became a radio announcer on a local radio station. Following California law enforcement's significant attempts to embroil Brian in a conspiracy to prepare, distribute, and exhibit obscene matter, the filmmaker criticized the concept of obscenity for its misguided use against gay cultural producers as a smokescreen for broader conditions of material inequality. He said of this, It's financial moguls making a killing out of manipulating the life and death expenses of the poor. It's killing of any kind. War. That's obscenity. Brian's fight against the law encapsulated a sentiment of both gay liberation activists and adult media industries towards the cultural and industrial struggle over the distribution of obscene matter. Legal attempts to tie Brian's enterprises to obscenity ultimately fell flat precisely because law enforcement's failure to connect the dots of the supply chain and conclusively verify the flow of Brian's products from production to exhibition. After walking away from the porn industry, Brian, now drowning in legal fees, got back to work. Brian began to make his own films under his company Vitruvian Productions. He made a film infamously called Seven in a Barn, starring, well, seven hot guys in a barn. Seven in a Barn is said to have the distinction of being the first gay porn film with synchronized sound. Tuesday Morning Workout also stands out from his roster of films, and it was a hit that gave him superstar-like status in the industry. Another notable standout from his collection is Raw Country, which at the time it was released, it opened to a standing room only crowd. This and subsequent films were distinguished by the appearances of all American young men in rural locations. However, after Raw Country was released, it was revealed that the investor of the film, a young teacher, had an appetite for young boys. This shook Brian to his core, and from then on, he chose to work with much older models. By the early 1980s, Brian transitioned his film operations to home video distribution under the name Vitruvian Video. Brian made one last film, Flashbacks, after a long hiatus from work. But by now, he had a strong alcohol addiction he had developed over the years. An addiction that would inevitably take his life. Brian Jeremiah Donahue, J. Brian, passed away at the age of 43 in 1985. One obituary credited him 
with being largely responsible for the influx of gay men to the golden California he painted in his creative productions. A testament not only to the influence of Jay Bryan's signature Golden Boys concept, but also the effectiveness of circulating the concept via distribution. Jay Bryan is relatively absent in histories of San Francisco's gay media industries. This absence is partially explained by the fact that Jay Bryan passed away so young, but similar to his more remembered contemporaries, such as Pat Rocco and Bob Miser, Jay Bryan was a politically engaged figure on the gay West Coast in the 1970s. Bryan worked to house and employ homeless and working class gay men throughout the gay community, independent from societally sanctioned modes of employment and welfare. Yet unlike Rocco or Miser, Jay Bryan has no official centralized archival collection from which to draw historical accounts of his life or work. Watching his films are all we have left, and they speak loudly of Jay Bryan's vision of youth, sexual freedom, and naturalism unfettered by society or its constraints. Aside from being some American firsts in gay porn, Seven in a Barn was based on a 1960s popular underground gay pulp novel of the same name attributed to Samuel Stewart, also known as Phil Andros, the 70s drummer magazine author, who in the 1930s was an intimate friend of Gertrude Stein and Alice B. Toklas. This would not be the first time Jay Bryan would be associated with Samuel Stewart, as Bryan also adapted Stewart's novel Stud, into the film For More Than Money in 1971. Seven in a Barn was among the first feature-length gay hardcore narrative films. Unlike hardcore documentaries like Marriage Manual Films that often employed Voice of God narration, hardcore narrative productions aimed to seamlessly fuse narrative and sex, a combination that was in alignment with the contemporary youth movements for sexual freedom and gay liberation. The so-called story film format was also another way to gain the larger public's recognition of gay pornography as a lucrative subcategory of adult cinema. Hey, John, wait up. Hi. I didn't think I'd see you here. Well, what's your hurry? I'm in no hurry. Seven in a Barn starts off with a voiceover while the picture shows the cast being introduced. In the voiceover, we find out these guys have started a sex club in which they all abide by the rules of the club. We meet John, who we find out is a college football hero, and probably the best looking guy in the bunch. Peter, whose dad owns a grocery store in town. Clyde, who's quiet and moody. Jerry, who's the youngest of the group. Frank, who works at the local gas station. Teddy, whose father is a minister. And finally, we meet Bill. This whole club is my idea. I organized it, and I plan to enjoy it. The rules of the game are pretty vague, but I guess we're not watching this film to think all that much. They drink beer, they begin to play cards, and as the game goes on, some of the guys lose their shirts. Bill wins, and is the leader, which means everyone has to listen to him. Once Bill is in charge, though, he wastes no time barking orders. While much of the sexual action that is worked into the narrative is oral, there are several penetration shots, and nearly every round of sexual action concludes with a money shot. And now that we're here, let's talk about that narrative. Seven in a Barn's narrative, if you can call it that, is as basic a narrative as it can get. But don't get me wrong, I can see how in 1971 this was a big deal, especially because of the seediness associated with porn loops in early gay porn films. Aside from the naked men, The synchronized sound has to be the biggest draw for audiences back then. Also, for people who love vintage gay porn but don't like the loud music soundtrack, this will be a fun watch for you. The film's own soundtrack is banjo-led country music that is introduced throughout the film. It gets loud at times, but for the most part, it is subtle enough for you to enjoy while watching. Upon its release, Seven in a Barn was a hit. A Variety reviewer described the film as a high-water mark in the genre. 
and acknowledgement in Variety was in alignment with broader press widespread coverage of hardcore narratives, both straight and gay, that followed the box office successes of Howard Zimes' heterosexual hardcore Mona in 1970 and Wakefield Poole's Boys in the Sand in 1971. Two films that ushered in the porno chic era that has been popularly attributed to Deep Throat in 1972. From 1971 to 1972, Brian self-distributed Seven in a Barn through extended road showings in San Francisco and Los Angeles. He also took Seven in a Barn and the rest of his films to university settings in a quixotic attempt to legitimize his films, promoting them as documents of the current gay culture trends. When visiting one college course, Brian emphasized tolerance and education as a key function of his films for straight audiences. I just want to show I am who I am, and you are who you are. And let's have fun with that. However, Brian's visits to college campuses were not always welcomed. Due to the novella's popularity on college campuses and the film's legitimizing story film format, Brian's Seven in a Barn was initially considered to be shown in a University of California, Irvine course on varieties of human sexuality in the fall quarter of 1971. However, faculty reportedly decided not to show the film because it was deemed pornographic. In 1972, the Gay Student Union at UCI scheduled Brian to appear on a panel discussing pornography, which would include a screening. The university administration had approved the event in February, but temporarily rescinded the permission to screen Seven in a Barn following anonymous complaints during the period of the event's promotion. Early on March 9th, the administration held a private hearing and preview screening of Seven in a Barn to a group of community leaders, faculty, and administrators to decide on the issue of screening the film at a public panel. Despite the fact that over 70% of the committee members voted to allow the film showing, the administration ultimately prohibited the film screening. Brian still appeared at the GSU panel, which reportedly drew 300 attendees. Orange County Police, acting on information from San Francisco Vice, who had viewed the film, were also present and confiscated Brian's print on the basis that the film was obscene. While the film was eventually returned to Brian and no obscenity charges were filed, a Los Angeles District Court dismissed the GSU civil rights suit against the Orange County Police and District Attorney. In the coming months, law enforcement increasingly targeted Brian on felony charges that would carry stronger sentences than misdemeanor charges like obscenity. On May 7, 1972, Brian was busted again in San Francisco on charges of aiding and abetting sodomy and oral copulation and the distribution of obscene matter based on testimony by a police informant. Police seized Brian's unfinished film, along with equipment including his camera and business records. In the gay press, Brian stated he would fight the case to the Supreme Court if necessary because the aiding and abetting claim was particularly broad and would allow for future prosecutions of theaters, bathhouses, and other spaces of gay male communal congregation. After charges were again dropped, Brian moved to Hawaii and went on hiatus from gay film production and distribution. Before his leave, Brian sold his distribution rights to his earlier production, Seven in a Barn, and another film, First Time Around, to Jaguar Productions, the producer-distributor of his most recent film, For More Than the Money. In February 1973, San Jose police raided the local Paris theater for exhibiting First Time Around. A judge in San Jose also declared Seven in a Barn obscene, and Brian had to return to California to stand trial. Police charged Brian, as well as the theater's manager and owner, with not just violation of the obscenity statute, but conspiracy to exhibit an obscene film which carried a potential sentence of 15 years in prison if convicted. According to Brian and his lawyer, police harbored anti-gay sentiments towards the filmmaker as a part of a larger crackdown on California gay independent film industries. It was the appearance of Jay Brian's name in the credits of the film and the eventual revelation that his name was a shortening of Brian's real name, Jeremiah Brian Donahue, which led the police to establish Brian's connection to the film and its exhibition. Significantly, Brian was one of the few gay filmmakers who used a variation of his legal name in the credits of his films. Jay Brian joined a small group of filmmakers like Jack DeVoe, Fred Halstead, Wakefield Poole, and Tom DeSimone, who embraced the gay liberation ethic and visibility by not using a fabricated name. Aside from the reasons mentioned in this video that add to the film's significance, Seven in a Barn is one of the first gay hardcore movies made for theatrical release. It was shot almost entirely in a single setting, 
a straw-filled barn in which seven suntanned all-American men sit in a circle playing strip poker. It is by all accounts a Jay Bryan film. If you have not seen it, find it, watch it, and tell me what you think. Very, very little is publicly known about the man whose stage name, depending on what day it is, was Dean Chasen, Dean Chasen, or Dean Chasen. So little that I debated making a video on him. It was a bit uncomfortable because every one of these videos lets me research, get to know someone, and share them again with you. We may not know a lot about Dean Chasen, but we do know that he did work with Jay Bryan a great deal in his career as well as with Falcon Studios. Chasen was a handsome, guy-next-door type with longish, dark blonde hair and a tan. He embodied the California look, the same look that made him appealing to director Jay Bryan. With Bryan, Chasen would be the lead in his hit movie Seven in a Barn. He would go on to work with Bryan again for Male Stampede and Tuesday Morning Workout. From there, Chasen did some work with Adonis Video, but then began to work with the future industry giant Falcon Studios. Falcon's first movie was a two-part loop called Muscle, Sweat, and Brawn, which featured Dean Chasen. Chasen would go on to appear in many Falcon titles, but none was probably more infamous than Brothers, which features a younger Chasen and Greg Chasen promoted as his brother. Hey, what's doing, I'm nuts. Oh, not much, Fruit Fly. Hey, where's Goofball? Oh, he's out rounding up some of those strays. Chasen's later career brought him to Catalina Studios, where he made a string of movies, mostly solo scenes, before filming his last known scene in 1994 in Catalina Studs. The VCR explosion inspired new models to pick look-alike and sound-alike names, hoping to benefit from a Chasen coattail effect. They were so second rate though that few would go on to be in another film. At this point, Dean Chasen was lost to porn posterity. What the hell? That was pretty good. Dean Chasen was one of the few models from the period to do well for himself financially, saving money from his appearances in porn and escort work and investing in real estate. I have read that by the end of the 80s, Chasen owned a vineyard in Southern California and a rental property. Dean Chasen's sounds like a genuine happy ending in an industry that can use many more. It's interesting that in an industry where today, most performers can choose to only show you or give you what they want, imagine how easy it was to disappear before the advent of the internet. If Dean Chasen is out there, alive and well, and sees this, I would love to know all as well and thank him for his contribution to gay erotic cinema. You've been watching Demons Define Gay Porn. I am your host, Ike Grande. Demons Define Gay Porn can be found on every podcast directory as well as YouTube. Demons Define Gay Porn is on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Telegram, Discord. And if you like what you're watching and want to be a part of the process, head over to patreon.com backslash demystifying gay porn where you can help support this channel and I can continue making content like this. Once again, this is Demystifying Gay Porn. My name is Ike Grande, and if you watch gay porn, I've definitely helped to get off. Cheers. (laughs) 